What can we learn from over 100 years of weather data at the Blue Hill Observatory? Today you'll hear about the history and current changes at the observatory on top of Great Blue. I'm Judy Lehrer Jacobs, Executive Director of the Friends of the Blue Hills. I'm Don McCaslin, Program Director at Blue Hill Observatory Science Center. And you're watching Blue Hills Alive, your guide to the Blue Hills, sponsored by Tom O'Neill of Success Realty in Milton. And if you have been to the top of Great Blue and the top of the observatory, let us know in the comments if you have seen that great view. And if you would like um, to have the chance for a dinner for six on top of the observatory as the sun is going down and you see the sunset, uh, you can go to friendsofthebluehills.org slash raffle2018 and um, purchase some raffle tickets that support the Friends of the Blue Hills. So I think we're all ready. Um, and so you want to just get us started by talking about the history of the observatory. It's been here for over 100 years. Yep. It was founded um, in 1885. The first day of full day weather observations was February 1st, 1885. The man who founded this place was named Abbott Lawrence Roach who owned and operated it from 1885 until 1912. He bequeathed it to Harvard, who owned and operated it um, until 1959. And then Harvard leased the building to the National Weather Service starting in 1960. Back then it was the U.S. Weather Bureau. The Weather Bureau, and then subsequently the National Weather Service, ran this place from 1960 until 1999. And then our nonprofit organization took over on May 1st, 1999. So it's only had four operators in the 133 years, and all four operators study and measure the weather the same way. Um, can you uh, can you talk a little bit about that kind of the consistency of the data and like why that would be important? Sure. So we are what's called a benchmark climate station. We use glass thermometers that are designed, built, and calibrated exactly the same as the thermometers from um, the 1880s. We have mercury barometers that are actually from the 1880s, including the oldest continually used mercury barometer in all of the USA. Our anemometers are designed, built, and calibrated to measure exactly the same as the ones from the 1800s. So by having those homogeneous data sets, wind, temperature, pressure, precipitation and all the other parameters of weather that we study, long-term climate scientists know that any changes, any trends that we see are true climatic trends as opposed to um, just changes in instrumentation or methods. So are there any of those instruments around here that you can show us? So here in the history room we have the Campbell Stokes Sunshine Recorder. This is the one that we used from 1898 until 1993. The only difference between this one and the one that's on the roof today is this is a bronze housing, the one on the roof is aluminum. Everything else about the two instruments and the predecessor to this one is the same. The size and shape and position of the special card holder, the size and shape and quality of the special Austrian uh, quality crystal glass ball, and the angle 42 degrees for our latitude, exactly the same. And this tool tells us when it's cloudy and when it's clear. The way it works is the sun shines through the crystal ball. The crystal ball magnifies the sun's rays into a pinpoint of light, which will burn a hole in the special measuring card. If it's clear, we get a nice long line like this. But wherever there's no holes, that means it was cloudy. Each vertical line is an hour of the day. So there's 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. So it works just like a sundial, and it tells us what time it was clear and what time it was cloudy for every minute of every hour of every day. And we've been using this technique since February 1st, 1885, when we opened. So it gives us a really good idea if we have a higher than average sunshine year or a lower than average sunshine year, such as the years uh, when volcanoes have uh, erupted and gotten into the upper atmosphere. That makes it a cloudier, less sunny year. And this is one of the ways we can monitor and record that. Great. Are there other things that you want to show us in the room? Sure. So over here we have an example of a contact making anemometer. I was talking a lot about the design built in Calgary the same way. Well, our anemometer on the roof now is three cups. This is four cups. But the performance is exactly the same. As the cups spin around and around, they turn the mechanism in the dial. And when the cups have gone around 640 times, this will go around one full time and hit a little switch. The switch will send a message to the special recorder, which makes a mark. 
that mark means a mile of air has passed the building, and we've used contact anemometers for studying wind passage since 1885 when we opened. Great, and um, I just want to thank Carol McGuire O'Keefe for um, making a little comment there. That's sweet. Um, so, um, so do you want to talk about the kinds of trends you can pull from the data related to the Blue Hill specifically? So one of the things, all of our measurements are specific to Blue Hill. So when people ask about global warming, we can't give you the information about global warming because we are only one site. However, our data correlates with data from around the world showing, for example, that temperatures are going up. For round numbers, the 19th century went up one degree Fahrenheit and the 20th century went up two degrees Fahrenheit. So it warmed twice as fast in the 20th century as it did in the 19th century. And we're hoping that it doesn't do twice again, meaning four degrees Fahrenheit in the 21st century. That would be very, very disruptive. But we're seeing those trends and the fact that the rate is up, up warming is faster now. And we've seen slight changes in precipitation, we also monitor the freeze and thaw of the ponds, noticing that they are freezing much later in the year and thawing much earlier in the year. So those are many different indicators showing uh, global showing warming here at Blue Hill. And because our trends match trends at other sites, that is evidence of global warming. Yeah, and so if you have any questions about how things have changed at the Blue Hills, um, just put a note in the comments and Don can get back to you. Um, there are so many things in this room. Um, do you want to talk about some of them? So um, we've talked about the contact in the monitor. We've talked about the Campbell Stokes sunshine recorder. We've talked about my phone that was supposed to be turned off. <laughs> and um, we do have modern technology. And if you do get to come here, you'll see a lot of kites both in our gift shop and here in the observatory history room. We have one kite that's made to look like the Wright Flyer. And that's because Orville and Wilbur Wright had heard about the kite experiments here at Blue Hill and how we used kites to lift a tool called a meteorograph to study the upper atmosphere. And they said, if you guys can lift that heavy weather instrument, and the meteorographs weigh between 12 and 20 pounds, depending on the specific one, if you can lift that heavy weather instrument thousands of feet up into the air, our record flight was 15,793 feet above sea level, you obviously have a good wing design. Would you share that design with us? So Mr. Abbott Lawrence Roach, the founder of this place, and one of his associates, Henry Helm Clayton, who was very active with the kite experiments, sent them photographs like these photographs we can see here of the Blue Hill box kite in particular. They also sent detailed drawings and descriptions of the Blue Hill box kite um, to find out um, how that might help the Wrights build their design. And the key feature of the Blue Hill box kite that the Wrights integrated into their kite is the consiguity framing, wires that allow the kite to be very, very strong without falling apart. Here's a little picture of the Wright flyer. And you can see all these crisscross rods between the top wing and the bottom wing. And those crisscross rods are the direct result of the tensegrity framing that a Blue Hill box kite has. And it makes the structure very, very strong without adding a huge amount of heavy weight with extra strong, extra bulky framing. So, Abbott and Wilbur, Orville and Wilbur became lifelong friends of Abbott Lawrence Roach, the founder of Blue Hill Observatory, and Henry Helm Clayton. Great. Um, so there is a lot of work right now going on at the observatory. Um, a lot of construction work. Do you want to kind of go over what's going on? And so why the it's key happening? work that happened in um, 2018 is a special temporary tower was installed in the backyard, and it's a mast that holds two different wind instruments right now, and that is to get correlation for the major renovations that will be happening in 2019. The top of the tower is crumbling a lot, and it needs to be replaced. In order to replace it, they're going to have to take down the wind instruments that are on the tower. Because of the importance of long-term homogeneous data, we are having the temporary tower in the back, and we're testing the data from that tower against the data on our tower to make sure it's the same, or if it is different, know exactly how different it is to ensure long-term homogeneous data. 
They will be cutting off the entire parapet off the top of our tower. Do you want to talk about what the parapet is? A parapet is the very, very top. Kind of hard to see. <laughs> Um, this is the 1885 tower, um, but that's the top, the part that goes around that has the crenellations, the cutouts that match the solar compass rows. On the um, new tower, they will be replacing the entire top, and so because they're going to be doing all that work, the wind masts have to come down. So we have a temporary tower in the back of the building at the exact same altitude as our current wind instruments to make sure we get the most consistent recording possible. Great. And what's the timing on that? Um, so we hope that they'll start the work as early in the spring as they can, as soon as the winter gives the construction crews the right conditions to start. And we're hoping that it will be finished hopefully before foliage season 2019. Oh, awesome. Um, uh, do you have anything else you want to add? So we are uh, totally open for business now. A lot of people have heard about the construction project and didn't know the exact timelines. It does change a lot as different things come up and we realize, oh, we have to take care of that before we can start the project. So we are 100% open from now through um, April of 2019 and then we will consistently post on our website, bluehill.org, and on our Facebook page, Blue Hill Observatory Science Center about what our hours will be both for school groups um, and other groups that come to the observatory and for the um, general public to come on our weekend tours that we always offer. So, it, so if someone comes on a weekend, they can, you're most likely to be open, but during the week are you open for general tours? So we do um, walk-in tours Saturdays, Sundays, and Monday holidays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you can book one seven days a week between 7.30 and 4.30 standard times. That means between 8.30 and 5.30 during daylight savings time. And the, we frequently are open by chance on weekdays. For example, today we are open because we're doing a project getting ready for a big kite festival. And since we have the staff here working on that kite festival preparation, if somebody walks in and says they want to do a tour, we certainly can do that. So weekdays are by chance or always by appointment. And then the weekends walk in unless the weather is extremely dangerous. Great. Um, and you want to talk a little bit about the Kite Festival? So we have multiple festivals coming up in um, September that we are going out to. This Sunday the 9th, we will be up in Haverhill at Tattersall Farm for their farm day, and we'll have kite flying demonstrations and kites for sale and kite making workshop. Saturday the 15th, we'll be in Cambridge at Danahee Park Family Day. We'll be working with the City of Cambridge to give away 1,200 free kites, plus we'll have kites for sale. And then on Sunday the 16th, in conjunction with Kites Over New England, we have a kite festival where there will be demonstrations of large kites, buggy kiting, which is a just like sailing, but it's on the land, you can actually get a buggy kite ride. And we'll have kites for sale and kite making there as well. And then um, we have on Columbus Day, we'll actually be traveling to Montreal, Canada for the Columbus Day weekend for an event called One Sky, One World. So Blue Hill Observatory continues to have worldwide reach, not just serving eastern Massachusetts, but serving scientists around the world, not only with our weather and climate data, but also with our kite services. Do you still use kites for weather, collecting weather data? We can't use kites here at Blue Hill because the maximum altitude we're allowed to fly is 200 feet above the hill. And that's not high enough to really get amazing data for upper atmospheric studies. The majority of upper atmospheric studies now are done with balloons. The weather balloon was actually developed here at Blue Hill, and you can see this, but way back in the 1930s, this is an example of a weather balloon sensor from the 1970s called a radio sonde, and um, this is what gets released now. The more modern ones are here. Here's a 2000s radio sonde, and they're released at stations around the nation. Here in the Northeast, they're released from Gray, Maine, Chatham on Cape Cod, Islip on Long Island, and Albany, New York. And they fly many thousands of feet higher than the kites could. Our highest kite flight was 15,793 feet. The weather balloons generally go between 60 and 80,000 feet above sea level. We'll see. So this is um, 
they were doing weather balloons. Yes, yeah. here's the north, the Hazen shelter. These are the rocks right in front of the observatory. And there's a couple of the large weather balloons getting ready to have the instruments attached. This gentleman's preparing the instrument, which will get attached to the balloon and then sent up into and the air. And what is that? Like what time period? Oh, um, like this picture is from the 30s, nice. um, around 1935 to 1936. And it was that time frame primarily because of the development of the radio technology that made it possible to send the balloons aloft, sending the information to the ground. Prior to that, graphing instruments had to be recovered. And that's why the kites were great, because we just wound in the kite and there was the instrument. But with the balloons, you'd have to go searching for them. And in this area, most of the balloons ended up landing in the ocean and we never recovered the data. So the radio technology has really, really improved the study of the upper atmosphere around the world. Okay, great. Before we wrap up, is there anything else in the um, room that you think is would be cool to see? So we have tons of stuff in here. Something we'll be demonstrating on September 21st is this tool called Nephoscope. And the Nephoscope is used for studying cloud motion. It's a, basically a mirror, and it would be set up on the roof to watch the clouds moving across. And by watching the cloud motion, we can predict things. Nowadays, we look at the cloud motion on, say, on satellite imagery. But before satellites, this mirror would be set up all um, observing sites all across, and they would keep track of the direction of the clouds, the speed of the clouds, and many things. On September 21st, we will be reenacting many of the timeline events for the hurricane of 1938, which happened on September 21st, and it's the 80th anniversary, so we have special events all day long here at the observatory, and then a lecture at Fuller Village that evening. And that uh, lecture at Fuller Village is for members only, um, but you can make arrangements to become a member, either Friends of the Blue Hills member or Blue Hill Observatory Science Center members. That's nice. Um, great. Uh, well, thank you. Is there any last um, thoughts? That Please you come and visit. Oh, great. Uh, well, thanks so much for watching Friends of the um, Blue Hills Alive. And um, if you want to have dinner on the top of the Great Blue, uh, the Blue Hill Observatory, you can purchase tickets for a raffle um, at friendsofthebluehills.org raffle 2018. And it's an amazing event. Um, and so we hope that you'll support the Friends of the Blue Hills and the Blue Hill Observatory. Um, thanks so much for um, talking to us. Thank and um,